the president at the UN. His topic, U.S.-Soviet relations. He makes a fist, but it holds an olive branch. This is INN, the independent news with Morton Dean. Good evening. Other leaders spoke at the UN today, but it was President Reagan who had center stage. He talked to the UN, but directed most of his words to the Soviet Union. Main topics, arms reductions, and Nicholas Danilov. Alec Roberts was there. The assembly. Hints of progress, hints of compromise, characterized President Reagan's fifth speech to the United Nations General Assembly. I can tell you the exchanges between our two sides this summer could well have marked the beginning of a serious productive negotiation on arms reduction. The ice of the negotiating stalemate could break if both sides intensify their effort in the new round of Geneva talks and if we keep the promises we made to each other last November. The president indicated a willingness to settle for less than a full loaf on his demands, including the administration's call for a 50% reduction in offensive nuclear weapons. If the Soviet Union wants only a lesser reduction, however, we are prepared to consider it, but as an interim measure. In other provisions as well, we have sought to take account of Soviet concerns, so there has been movement. President Reagan also said he was open to compromise on the number of medium-range missiles in Europe and on limiting nuclear testing. In addition, he offered to share Star Wars research with the Soviets. But on one issue, President Reagan showed no flexibility, the spy charges and detention of U.S. journalist Nicholas Danilov. Nicholas Danilov is an innocent hostage who should be released. The Soviet Union bears the responsibility for the consequences of its action. Despite the president's tough talk on the Danilov case, he fell short of demands by some conservatives that all talks with the Russians cease until the journalist is released. The president indicated by his words that summit preparations and talks toward a new disarmament treaty would continue. The first official Soviet reaction to the president's speech came from Deputy Foreign Minister Vladimir Petrovsky. I must say frankly that I'm disappointed at what I have heard today. But at the same news conference, Petrovsky hailed the historic cooperation between the U.S. and Soviet Union in agreeing to new security measures to prevent the outbreak of war in Europe, the Stockholm Conference. On another subject, the deputy foreign minister indicated the Soviets have offered a solution to the Danilov case, although he refused to say what it is. We see such a possibility, we believe it is possible, and we believe that it is up to the United States now. For the Independent News, I'm Alec Roberts in New York. More now on what the president's speech meant and didn't mean, our guest, Alan Romberg. He's the senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Affairs. Mr. Romberg formerly served the State Department as its chief spokesman. Mr. Romberg, thank you very much for dropping in tonight. We're, we're told that it's important to read behind the lines and between the lines uh, when, when international uh, politicians, diplomats speak. Uh, what, what do you make of the president's speech? What was he really saying? I think he was really saying what he said in the words. That is, there are two principal points. Uh, one is that he wants to reach agreements on arms control. And he laid out some of the possible specifics of that. Uh, the other is that, nonetheless, the Danilov case has cast a pall over U.S.-Soviet relations. And until it is resolved, uh, it is unlikely that we're going to get progress towards a summit or towards final agreement on those key issues. Do you sense that it will be resolved and resolved soon? I can't say that it definitely would be. My sense is that both sides indeed are talking as though they are working uh, for a solution, uh, one which would allow each of them to meet uh, the principles they've enunciated, that is for the U.S. to make it clear we have not made a trade. Mr. Danilov for the Soviet U.N. employee who was arrested on espionage charges, Mr. Zakharov, the Soviets to uh, claim that indeed there was an equivalency and, a, and in essence a trade. Both sides can claim victory. Right. Is, is there any reason to believe that uh, Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev uh, are, as sometimes we're told, speaking a, a different language to one another or uh, is what we see um, pretty much what the U.S. policy is in private? Oh, I think it is very much what the U.S. policy is in private. I think that indeed uh, Mr. Reagan laid out for the first time publicly what has been reported 
as uh, background statements or leaks in the press previously on his terms for uh, sticking Wars. to Star Wars mm -hmm. and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Uh, so uh, I have no reason to think that there are basically different messages being uh, conveyed privately than what we have seen. Do you think that, uh, is, is it possible that because of the Danilov affair that the Soviet Union, uh, possibly feeling embarrassed by it all, mm -hmm. uh, might be stimulated into being more accommodating to uh, a U.S. point of view on arms control, uh, say? No, I don't think so. I th perhaps they've learned something about the importance to Americans of uh, dealing properly with correspondence. But uh, it, there's no suggestion, I think, that the Soviets will in any way accommodate us to make up for uh, a mistake or for not taking the president seriously when he says Mr. Daniloff is not a spy. They will do what they see as in their security interests, just as we will. Mr. Gorbachev gives the appearance of being a man who, if not a man who has been around, a man who is relatively worldly in his, in his thinking, uh, does he really believe what he says when he says that the Soviet Union caught Danilov red-handed? What's your opinion about that? Well, it's hard to know exactly what Mr. Gorbachev means when sure. he uh, talks in those terms, but it may well be that Mr. Danilov uh, violated uh, their norms of behavior, that he violated perhaps even some of their laws. I don't know that for a fact, but clearly he knows that the Soviets set Mr. Danilov up. So when he says he was a spy caught red-handed because of that activity, no, he, uh, he understands what the facts are. Finally, Mr. Romberg, do you think that the U.S. Uh, and the USSR are near a breakthrough period in their relations? In overall relations? Yeah. I don't know if you'd call it a breakthrough. I think if you look back over the last year and a half, however, you see a steady progress or progression of better linkages, put it that way, uh, conversations on regional issues which are so important to the relationship bilateral matters getting resolved, uh, the agreement over the Pacific route so that we don't have another Korean airline shoot down, that sort of thing. Uh, so I think that there has been progress in that sense. I'd shy away perhaps from terms such as breakthrough. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly I would hope there could be a breakthrough, if you will, on the negotiating front on arms control. I think that's terribly important. But there are fundamental differences between these two societies, and I think that we will have to live with that. And this so-called spy affair really proves that. Absolutely. Alan Romberg, thank you very much for coming in and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. An unusual admission by the Soviet Union today. The Soviet news agency TASS reports that two armed men tried to hijack a Soviet jet on Saturday. But according to the Soviets, the hijacking never got off the ground. They say police stormed the plane and killed the would-be hijackers. Two policemen and two passengers were reportedly killed in the incident as well. TASS described the would-be hijackers as drug addicts. The aborted hijacking took place at an airport in Ufa, 700 miles east of Moscow. The plane was en route to Siberia with 76 passengers on board. It was the 16th known hijacking incident in the Soviet Union since 1970. Coming up, a new report charges NASA officials were very much aware of the problems that led to the space shuttle tragedy. And later on Health Beat, the seeing eye glasses that use sound to help blind people see. The Independent News brought to you by Extra Strength Bufferin and by the General Foods Corporation. Oh, a headache now. Anybody seen my extra strength buffering? Yeah, my shoulder hurt. And Kim took it. Sore leg. It'll help that. Kim, got my buffering? Steve does. Got a backache moving scenery. They all know how good my buffering is. Extra strength buffering for Steve's backache, Kim's legs, John's shoulder, Debbie's headache. It goes to where you hurt fast with an extra strength dose of relief. Curtain going up. And I'm ready. For headaches and a lot more, extra strength buffering. Also in regular strength from Bristol Myers. You know, when people drop by my apartment, they say, well, this is the apartment. You can guess what they say. They say, don't you have a couch? Don't you have a dining room set? Dining room set. I do, however, have Maxwell House instant coffee. Seems to reassure most folks that I'm a reasonably tasteful guy. And after one or two cups, they forget they're sitting on lawn furniture. <laughs>